my starting point is always gathering information, observing, reading, listening, understanding. And therefore, the initial process is, is not a, necessarily a very fast one. The philosophy is that the root of the design must be so solid, so robust, uh, almost, you know, bulletproof, because that is what will allow, uh, you know, the tree to grow high and, and, and the trunk to be really strong. Hello and welcome to Architecture, Design and Photography. Today we are speaking with Luis Vidal, a top global architect and owner of Luis Vidal Architects, an international award-winning architecture firm based in Madrid, Spain. Luis Vidal is the architect for some of the world's top airports, including London Heathrow and Zaragoza Airport in Spain, as well as Pittsburgh International, Boston Logan, and Dallas-Fort Worth in the U.S., Today, uh, Luis will be joining us via Zoom, so hopefully technical things are all in line and we'll have a good conversation. Should be interesting. Thanks for joining us. You're responsible for designing immense and magnificently expensive spaces like airports, uh, which will influence and interact with most of our lives, things that only cities or countries can afford. So when you want to not be under that kind of pressure, what are you doing for recreation and what has it taught you about design? Well, I think that our buildings are not necessarily expensive. Uh, they're just big and because they're big, uh, just by the you know, cost per square feet, it adds sure. up to more. Uh, I, I love design. I enjoy designing. I enjoy doing a new thing. So whenever I'm in a recreation moment, I'm still looking, observing, and looking at ways of uh, making things better. So whether, you know, whether it's a bicycle I'm observing, or whether it's a doorknob, or whether it's a, it's a bathroom faucet, uh, I will always be looking at doing things uh, better for, for the public. It's, it's very much what we do. We're, we are... Um, uh, client oriented so if we're doing an airport we think and we put passengers first if we're doing a hospital we put patients first so it's really the way we we work and definitely is the way my mind um, functions so when you're considering an airport why put uh, passengers first rather than the owners and managers of the airport well it's very easy who are the clients of the owners and managers of the airport mm -hmm. So they, these are the passengers. You see, it, it's interesting because if you were ask, to ask a city who the passenger belongs to, they would say the city. If you ask the airlines, they will say passengers belong to them. If you ask the airport owner, they will say the passengers belong to them and the same with concessions. But at the end of the day, they all fail to acknowledge the passenger belongs to himself. Right. And therefore, it's, you know, it's all about the freedom of the passenger. So if you can design an airport, putting passengers first and thinking of their freedom, their freedom to move and fly through the building as they wish, not being forced to be inside a shopping mall from where planes eventually take off. If you can achieve those things, then you're really achieving the best uh, standards in the industry uh, for those passengers who in the long run will continue and return to your airport. So, you know, everyone wins. Okay. Uh, in, uh, in formulating a, a design for an airport, how much does the conversation exist between the city or the, the, the commissioning party, generally a city, I would imagine, and the actual airlines and the architect. Is that a three-way conversation constantly? Or is it specifically uh, with the city and the airlines get what they get? No, 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 no. It definitely varies city to city, and it varies on who the owner is. In the United States, most airports tend to have a combination of very strong <laughs> bonding between the owner, the stakeholders, and the airlines. So, you know, it's a three-way or four-way dialogue. Uh, very fruitful, uh, very enriching, 
and very necessary because at the end of the day, they all need to be very happy and they need to co-share, co-live, you know, a very large infrastructure project building for many, many years. So you need to get everybody's buy-in. Okay, so uh, to to get into the mind a little bit more of uh, s- someone who is uh, taking on the implementation and the realization of something as valuable as this kind of infrastructure, I'd like to get a little bit more behind the mind, the things that influence you, motivate you. And in finding a question to kind of understand that, what can you recommend for a book and a documentary and why? Nothing to do with design, but the things that you entertain yourself with before you bring yourself to design as far as a book and a documentary. Well, funny, you know, I have about five or six books always open at the same time. Uh, Some of very large scale, you know, like super extra large scale, which I just like flipping over, uh, contemplating really nice pictures. I always have uh, some sort of book related to art. I am uh, very close to to art. I also look at uh, some fiction and I always have some sort of biography open at the same time. I'm looking at different ways of um, getting um, different influences and always keeping a very open mind about things that are going on. In relation to documentaries, I always like history documentaries. I like uh, things that uh, also open the exploration, exploration of uh, our planet and the exploration of our uh, galaxy. So I'm a very curious person, always looking to find new sources of inspiration and uh, new sources of knowledge. So when it when it comes to airports, these are kind of the um, pinnacle of our technology when it comes to transportation. But we are looking at a new frontier with with space travel, Mars, Elon Musk, SpaceX, all of that. Do you does your mind start to gravitate towards thinking about? What is the next iteration of airport with that in mind? Well, over uh, 10 years ago, we designed the first commercial spaceport in planet uh, oh, wow. in Denver. So, yes, we were quite pioneers in doing that. We were definitely the first Spanish company and, and the first architectural practice in the world to design a commercial spaceport. So we've always been looking at being at the forefront in in this type of uh, new technologies. So this was a commercial spaceport, not a uh, a government controlled airbase, but more of a commercial spaceport for companies to utilize. Correct. It was designed as a commercial spaceport for any airline that wanted to explore that. Uh, bit of space, you know, whether it was a, a United or American or, you know, Lufthansa, British Airways, this was a spaceport designed to provide them with an infrastructure space where they could start trying uh, those um, spacecrafts or, uh, you know, a fast uh, spaceships, which would be able to travel around half the globe in two and a half hours. Wow. And is this currently in use, being used? I haven't really heard anything about this in in the media or anything else. Yeah, since then, there have been a number of spaceports built around the world and technology has been tested. And the first flights, first commercial flights were supposed to go in uh, 2023. Uh, COVID has obviously delayed uh, these type of flights for a couple of years. But you may have heard some Flights have already taken place, uh, so we've had already some first man go up and uh, take a little picture of that blue ball and come down again. Ah, yes, we were we were actually I think just about forty miles uh, away from Jeff Bezos, uh, his project that he just launched this winter when it went off, and I didn't know about it. A friend of mine who's very interested in all of that, uh, you know, texted me. He's like. 
look to the east or wherever we were and you're going to see Jeff Bezos' thing. But unfortunately, we were in a big box store where I didn't have cell phone reception and I didn't get to see it. But oh, well. <laughs> um, before we get into too much more of the technical stuff, my last kind of personal question to understand your mind a little bit more is what is your guilty media pleasure at this time? I like to watch Pawn Stars. It's a show on the History Channel where they they buy and sell stuff that, you know, is gets sold at pawn shops and is always interesting for the dialogue and everything else. But uh, what is it for you? Well, believe it or not, I hardly watch television and I hardly watch any series. So what really recreates me is uh, having a space. I, I love being in very large spaces and volumes. Uh, with a very good quality light, whether it's natural or artificial, having a really good sound system, so I may play classical or I may play any other type of music that I like, and being around with uh, my wife and uh, speaking, having a you know an interesting conversation on whatever, whether it's a daily issue, whether it's a political issue, whether it's a, something about our projects, uh, while flipping those books and talking and discussing. I like that. Uh, how did you learn to appreciate that? Did, did that naturally happen in your family growing up, or was this something you gravitated towards through experiences? I think it's something that gradually grew in me as I uh, got more and more mature. I've always uh, looked at uh, different masters, uh, going all the way back to Leonardo, but also in, in architecture. And what's always fascinated to me is uh, how they all had time to read and review things and uh, relook at projects. You know, when when we um, used to draw by hand, uh, the way of designing had a lot of reflection time, because at the time you were drawing, and some of the drawing was monotonous. You could think back at what you had drawn, or you could think forward at what you were going to draw. And the old masters used to be able to sit down and reflect and, and, and read. As technology has progressed, everything is so much faster that we have much less time to reflect or think forward. And maybe that's something I was missing, and that's maybe why I have gravitated to that. I need to find my space to look back and uh, have quality time to think. Yeah, that's that's something that I've personally noticed in my life that before cell phones, uh, you'd get in the car with someone and the options were listen to the radio or talk to the other person in the car. Now it's one person drives, hopefully not on their phone, and the other person's on their phone usually. And you don't have that time of, nothing to talk about that makes you talk about something that that allows for that dead space to then you know talk and have an engaging conversation which i think is something extremely important for our own human development to to allow these ideas that have put on been put on the back burner to actually come forward and be spoken about and it's it's uh it leads into one of our other questions here down the line that with artificial intelligence, big data, and this overwhelming availability of guilty pleasure entertainment series, you know, Facebook, television series, um, Instagram, you name it, we're constantly able to be entertained, yet very rarely forced to be reflective. And it sounds like you've carved that out in your life. Do you have a, an intentional process of putting your phone aside turning it off and, and allowing for that time? Or what do, you, what do you do for that? Well, I'd like to reply two things. The first one you're saying, we have an immense variety of uh, entertainment. And my question is, are we really being entertained or are we really being uh, switched off and directed somewhere else? Uh, responding to your question, uh, since uh, I have three, three kids and uh, I tended to try and be home always for dinner with them, with my wife. And uh, since they were, you know, very little, we have excluded technology from the table. 
So, for example, there's, there's never been any technology around the table. We have no TV in the uh, kitchen or the dining area, so the TV is never switched on. They never had Wi-Fi at their bedrooms. We had a specific study area where they could, you know, work and look at the internet, and the printers were there and everything. But so we've we've always, as a family, tended to have a a hub, a a, a familiar hub where we encouraged reading, uh, talking, discussing, thinking, you know, many things that you walk into a normal household today and you don't see, as you were saying, before you get onto the car and uh, people don't talk anymore. I guess a side note question that's very interesting to me, uh, how, how did your children receive that? Well, I mean, if you're comfortable talking about it, what age are your children? How did they receive that? Did, was there a lot of pushback? And did, is that uh, common in Spanish culture or is that unique to your family? I think it's very unique to my family. Uh, you know, Spain is as advanced technologically as any other European or, uh, you know, North American country. No, if, 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 the, if the rules are set from the beginning and, you know, there's, there's no exceptions, so you don't slightly, you know, give in one day and the other day, then they understand it. And nowadays, you know, they actually thank us for that. They really thank us for that. Those are incredibly uh, valuable uh, things to impart to your children and your family. I, I find that we strive for the same thing in our family, and it's easy to do that for the children. The hardest part for us has been to actually get the parents to leave the phone away from the table and leave the phone away from the living room. We don't have a television or anything else like yourself, uh, but man, those phones, they just, they consume you. <laughs> It, it takes a lot of discipline and there's always uh, an exception. You're always waiting for a very important phone call. Uh, you may get a client call you late at night, but you really have to keep that discipline. And as I say, if you start making exceptions, then you go down the hill. There, there is a quote that I'll misquote, but get close. Um, there's no significant technological advance for us that does not come with some societal degradation it's that there's like an advance that is good in many ways but it degrades us that we have to have this learning curve of how to learn to deal with the degradation that that advancement in technology brings that we're not we're not adapted to yet and that's it's nice to see uh someone implementing that and uh forming their family around that consciously and in uh, with intention that's that's interesting. Um, probably has a lot to say about where you're at with your business and your design to begin with. <laughs> um, so to get more into the technical stuff that that applies to exactly what you do, uh, in your view, how will the design of airports change following this pandemic? What do you think is going to change? What do you think is going to stick around? Uh, what what are we going to look like five years from now compared to a year ago? Well, first of all, I think the, the pandemic is just the first one of many other things that may happen. And there could be other pandemics or there could be other sort of uh, tragi tragedy situations for our society. So what this uh, pandemic has taught us is to reinforce something that we have always built into our buildings and our designs, which is flexibility. In fact, we just completed pre-COVID uh, the first, uh, actually the first lead platinum university campus in the world uh, for um, Loyola. You may, you may know of Loyola. So we did the latest uh, campus in Seville, in Spain, uh, which was designed 100% flexible in terms of uh, uh, shifting and moving rooms and areas and opening up to the fresh air. It was really revolutionary and, and it's actually demonstrated through COVID and now that we're getting out of COVID that designing with flexibility is the most important and in my opinion paramount thing. So we've always designed airports uh, thinking about flexibility and I think that 
is part of, of, of what we've been, for, for example, introducing in, in Pittsburgh. Pittsburgh Airport, which is uh, ready to start its construction, it's always been about being able to bring the inside out and bring the outside in. And what we're fascinating about now is designing with the ability to move walls, but also move uh, floors and move ceilings and transform entire volumes within minutes, not within days or months, so that we can really adapt very quickly to the need of the moment, to queuing areas, to different densities in, in those uh, public buildings, and really being able to, to adjust. So, and then to finish your, your, your question, we will see a number of uh, visible measures which will be here to stay, uh, visible measures which will impact on the way we perceive of those spaces. Uh, maybe uh, contactless uh, solutions, uh, social distancing, uh, maybe the use of masks, maybe we will stop using masks, but we will see the use of uh, health and sanitary passports. And then we will have a number of invisible measures which will be there observing us without us knowing, you know, taking our body temperature, identifying us through facial recognition, having a, a record of our health and, um, you know, other records on, 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 our, on ourselves. So, and, and those buildings and com combining big data and artificial intelligence will be scrutinizing and assisting the airport managers on, on how to, they are handling it. That leads into my next question that I think is, is really interesting in these times. Because um, everything you're saying, I have a lot of family in, in the US that, uh, how, do I, how do I put this? Um, <laughs> they, they, uh, they have more of a Orison Wells view of the future than, um, than others. Uh, they, they lean a little more right. And there's, a, there's an American culture that I would imagine there would have to be a design sensitivity to American culture that would be different when designing in a European culture. Have, have you found that with your experience? It sounds like your children have gone to school in the U.S., so it sounds like you have a lot of experience in both cultures. Do you, do you find uh, contrast and difference there? Oh, yes, definitely. Uh, they are obviously very similar societies in the way we're structured economically, socially, culturally. But at the same time, uh, I would say in some respects, the fast thrive of the United States has a counterbalance with the maybe uh, more of the historical legacy of the European culture. Um, there's also two huge differences. Uh, the United States is united with a common flag, a common language, and a common currency. In, in Europe, we don't have a common flag, we don't have a common language, and we very recently had a, a common currency. So those things also establish a, you know, a difference in between. So I think what the power of, of this is if you can combine the strengths of both, and I think my kids have been very fortunate in having both a European and an American um, background and DNA. I mean, I have to say that we've spent, since they were born, we will always spend our summer holidays in the United States. So they've always been exposed to that. Where were your, where were your go-to uh, vacation spots in the U.S., if I can ask? Well, we used to go to Belvedere in um, San Francisco. So my, 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 wife, my wife was born in New York. She was raised in San Francisco. She lived in Belvedere. And that's why we would go there every summer. She ah, would ah. Uh, continue to meet with her older school friends. And their children became best friends with our children. So, you know, it was, it's been like a very nice pass on generation um, experience. And with the, with the, with the, 
uh, design and technological implementation of these airports in the future. Uh, a lot of the things you're saying as far as, uh, you know, temperature tracking, uh, vaccine passport type stuff, these are all hot topic, um, uh, hot potatoes really in the U S right now. There's a very much an American sentiment, uh, that is, is highly, highly oriented to the individual being independent and very suspicious of any type of big brother kind of thing that wants to push back against any, uh, any of these things that are, you know, safety concerns of tracking and, and, uh, and keeping things like COVID from running rampant and killing a bunch of people. But in the U S specifically, I, because I'm, I'm not necessarily of that mindset, but I observe it and it's, it's a weird conflict. And, and I imagine you bump up against that, uh, that highly individualistic sentiment when designing things for the U S do you have to account for that or, or is it not manifest in design as much? It is um, always a topic of conversation and discussion and, you know, conversations with uh, TSA conversations with the airlines, with concessions. But let me make a reflection to you. Um, the IRS has all the information about us. The banks have all our financial information about us. Hospitals have all our health information about us. Schools, colleges have all the information about us. And that's individual. That's with, with name, you know, with, with a specific name. But now let's take uh, another step. Uh, for more than 10 years, shops, when we go shopping, especially when we buy clothes, have been taking uh, volumetric images of our bodies. And all that big data has been used to design all the new clothes so that, you know, all those big manufacturers have all the patterns of how the body of people is changing. Whether wow. we're now taller or whether we have longer legs or whether we have wider or narrower shoulders and all the different building forms are being used, analyzed and used to design all the new clothes. So if you think about all the power of all this information that they have about us, now with facial recognition, it could be very easy to attach, you know, your building volume to your name. It's, it's all about coming down to the morality of it. Is someone going to be able, or do they already, combine all this information together? Can they get your IRS and your financials and your health and your culture and your education and your body and everything from you together? That's, that's a real question you, you're posing. And I think we have no escape from it. You, you go into Google, and Google is already advertising something related to what you just saw. That's only because they are tracking everything you're looking at. So the reality is people have to come to grips that there's no way out. How, how do you feel about that uh, personally, as someone who sees that uh, produced things with their own narrative as a means of entertainment within your family uh, can be distracting and not something that leads you closer to an actual deeper understanding and an actual truth. And so that aspect of it, you know, we both agree on that this is kind of it's dangerously entertaining, those things, uh, and it can be quite a distraction from progress. Um, but at the same time, then there's this different thing of us being observed that is uh, not regarded as as much dangerous. Is that do you see it that way or? Well, I'll give you another example. I've lived in England for more than 15 years. 
and uh, they take pride that they don't have any any sort of ID. So in in Spain, in most European countries, we have an ID very much similar to your social security uh, card. The main difference is that here uh, we have a photo ID, whilst the uh, social security well the social security number uh, card now has a photo ID. Uh, but that's that's all your way of identification. In, in the UK, they don't have any form of, of ID and they feel freer. But my real question is that they are as identified as we are. So coming back to my, my previous answer, I think that we can fight against the system or we can pretend that we don't know or whichever route you want to take, it's here. It's like, it's like pretending cars do not exist. And that, you know, we should continue to ride bicycles. It seems like, I don't know if you've seen The Social Dilemma. It's a documentary on social media. And it's, it's an unavoidable thing that these designers of social media are also, you know, in a, in a sense, victimized as well by what they design because they, they make it so tailored to the human psyche to be wrapped up in. And it's unavoidable. It's going to happen. There's no single entity behind it trying to take advantage of us. It's us taking advantage of ourselves, even to the extent that the actual designer gets addicted to this thing. And it's unavoidable that this technology and information is going to happen. And it seems like conversations like this and, and people like yourself being involved in that process and having a public conversation about all of it, it seems like the best way forward. It's absolutely unavoidable that big data, artificial intelligence, and, and this technical information age is, it's just absolutely unavoidable. It will happen. It is happening. Um, but just having these conversations around that uh, to bring it to the awareness and to uh, established practices like you have in your own family are, are very healthy. And I, I'm, I'm really impressed with that. And uh, maybe it'll be a little bit of an impetus to do more of that in my own family. I appreciate that. But Trent, Trent let, me, let me interrupt you for a second. I think that we are just beginning to touch on something which I think is the most exciting and the most accelerating thing that is going to happen in the next decade. So I, I think we have just opened the door to the fastest and the deepest. And um, if you want to use another word, um, dense decade. We, in 10 years, we're going to live the same amount of intensity that our parents or grandparents lived in 100 years. So in 10 years, we will live what others have lived in 100 years. And let me, let me tell you why. First is the pandemic. You know, we've gone through a pandemic that will change our lives no matter what. The second is climate change. Everyone's forgotten about, about climate change, but climate change was here pre-pandemic and remains to be here and is becoming it's coming back into the agenda. The third issue is uh, finance. We have never, ever had so much money available across the globe. And this money, all those financial institutions are now investing worldwide, transversely, moving into lots of different interests and sectors. Fourthly, we've touched upon artificial intelligence, big data, digitalization. That is a huge exponential change. And finally, the social revolution. We see a global social revolution in Asia, in Europe, in America. We see lots of migratory um, immigration. We see the rise of uh, different types of uh, populism. So the entire world is in its most exciting moment. I, uh, it, it's, it seems to me when I reflect on all of our technological advances that the, the commonality 
the driving force and the purpose behind them seem to be information at, at its base in some way, shape, or form. At our, you know, as our foundational base, we have genetic information. And then our best way of uh, uh, keeping morals that we've established over centuries, millennia, millions of years, whatever, uh, is through the information of story. We, we, we put morals to stories to keep them going, to keep them around. But again, it's all in service of the information, the information of how to behave, the information of how to make another human, the information of what it means to be human is now going between us at a rate that we've never experienced before. And it's, it, it seems like if there's an essence to what being, what life is, it, it would seem at its core, it's an organization of information out of chaos into, um, into uh, you know, a realm of order that continues to grow upon itself. I believe everyone has their own uh, truth. Everyone has their own right. And, uh, you know, what I really appreciate are conversations like, like this one, where one can share ideas and, uh, you know, our minds, both my mind and your mind are opening to new things. So, you know, I, I find it very, very interesting. Uh, there was once a philosopher that uh, explained that education is equal to repression, uh, based on the thought that, you know, we are born as animals and we are suddenly driven to, you know, eating well and behaving well and doing things just because we are continuously told what not to do. Whilst I like the attitude, which is what I've always encouraged, is the reverse, always explaining what to do. And I, I, I believe that grows up people which are half more moral and more connected to the world and to the society and to their family and that they really, you know, have higher values. Could you, could you say that last section there again? The... So what I'm saying is I am a very strong believer in doing the opposite. Rather than educate through repression, educate through inspiration. Educate through telling people what is good. Explaining to them the positive things that embrace, that uh, inspire, that help understand what is morally good. It's about teaching humans to be better connected with the planet, with the world, with their society, with their family, with their peers in school. So I am a very strong believer, as I say, on the exact opposite of the repression education formula. I, I have a similar personal philosophy with my two boys that if I spend the day telling them what not to do, um, and giving them boundaries at the end of the day, I'm still putting to bed two boys that don't necessarily understand why those boundaries are there and still have the desire in their character to understand, but also, uh, you're closer to them actually pushing through those boundaries that are, are there for protection because I haven't, I haven't inspired them, as you're saying, towards something better. I've only tried to essentially control them with my authority in their lives to tell them, don't do this, don't do that. If I'm not present all day, I'm working on something and they're playing and I simply tell them, don't, don't, don't stop it. Don't do that. Don't do that. Be quiet. At the end of the day, I'm putting to bed the same kid that woke up that morning and we don't have any more of a relationship. If I'm present with them and I model the behavior that I want them to have through relating to them and being present, 
and I discuss with them the things that are good and why they're good and allow them as free open spaces to go into uh, to test on their own and to mess up and fail as well. At the end of that day, I'm putting to bed a different human, one that is inspired and one that has more of an actual relationship with me and is 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 closer to uh, my understanding of truth in how things progress in a positive way. Yeah, absolutely. I think there's, there's, there's another interesting comment. Um, I, I was once, um, you know, told by a friend and it's about, you know, when, when your children accomplish something and they tell you, oh, you should be very proud of your son. Um, whilst I believe it should be the opposite. He should be very proud of himself. And that's a, that's a, a, a teaching that, uh, you know, I learned. It's them taking also ownership for that. Right, right. Yeah, there's a quote for uh, Jimmy Carter, the U.S. president. Um, a, a reporter had interviewed his mother. And uh, the reporter had asked his mother, well, you must be very proud of your son. And her immediate response was, well, which one? <laughs> and, you know, in, in her... Uh, in her mind, you know, these accomplishments, uh, I think for her, it was probably more about character than the actual position of power that either son had achieved. <laughs> um, could you describe your philosophy uh, as you see it as, as best as you could convey to someone uh, through Zoom over international waters, uh, your design and creativity process, your philosophy that drives that? Well, our philosophy has always been about making things better. And you can only make something better if uh, you understand how it works and if you understand what sort of problems uh, are entailed and if you can listen to your client. So my starting point is always gathering information observing, reading, listening, understanding. And therefore, the initial process is, is not a, necessarily a very fast one. The philosophy is that the root of the design must be so solid, so robust, uh, almost, you know, bulletproof, because that is what will allow, uh, you know, the tree to grow high and, and, and the trunk to be really strong. If, if you pretend to start quickly and get on a run without really having that solid base, then that has a lot of chances of failure. So that's part of a philosophy. Another part of a philosophy is to be inclusive. We, and that's why I speak in plural, we are a team. Uh, every good design is the product of the best team, the best client, and the best contractor. So getting everyone into the room, aligning objectives, aligning aspirations, and making sure that everyone really feels that they own that project, and getting the best consultants, and getting you know whatever uh, it takes to, to generate the best, the best team. And finally, the philosophy of, impregnates, that impregnates everything, is a quality, quality, quality. Uh, there's only one, there's only one word. And, uh, you know, I, I don't cease to repeat that word. Quality must impregnate every single little step of the process. So I would say those are the three steps, or the, or the three pillars of, of my philosophy. Um, to have someone who uh, enjoys interacting with philosophical ideas. I'd, I'd need to run this question by you. Uh, I've, been, I've been thinking about the, the contrast between chaos and order. And to me, it seems that there isn't actually any chaos. There's simply, a, one, a lack of understanding of what you're observing to be chaos. 
and that actually that chaos is just an order and uh, laws of governing it that you don't understand yet. Because as soon as you understand something, it ceases to be chaos. It becomes something that is a tool that you can use. And so is that to say that there, everything has an order and our purpose is to continually strive towards understanding more and more of the chaos, finding the chaos and exploring it and coming back with something that we can contribute, essentially. I, I completely agree. And you can also turn it upside down and say order doesn't really exist. So they both need to coexist with each other. And uh, one of the very interesting uh, routes to understand this two-way route or, or process is the theory of fractals. I don't know how um, acquainted you are with the theory of fractals. And for some time, I used to you know, play around with it quite a lot on some, on some of my lectures, on the, the discovery of, of different frontiers. But as I say, I like always to think uh, it's always a two-way stream, not only one way. Hmm. And and by fractals, I'm I'm imagining the uh, is it broccolini or what is that? It's a it's a thing that's like broccolini, and they grow in this spiral shape. It's like looks like broccoli, but it has this incredible uh, spiral shape as it generates. Uh, I think bee bee nests incorporate that. There's a lot of of thing and is the the Mandelbrot set part of the fractal discussion? You can take fractals all the way back to the Big Bang if you want. So you know there are plenty of theories that say everything is a fractal or a form or a part of a fractal, and uh, the structures and the systems that they generate. So you find fractals in everything in nature. You find fractals in every atom of our body. Um, so. As I say, when you observe fractals, they look like chaos, but then when you understand them and put them together, they have an order, they have a rule, they have a pattern. And then again, you can zoom out of that order and return to seeing chaos. Big data and AI, how will this materialize and interact with our lives in the airports of the future? Well, I mean, we are, for example, working on big data and AI on building schemes. So we are developing different uh, systems. We are gathering sufficient information to provide us with uh, much faster and efficient solutions to building schemes of our buildings. At the end of the day, we, we tend to do a lot of trial and error and I will give you an example. We had to renovate an existing building in Madrid, an office building, which uh, was you know, unwanted. It, it was in a very bad uh, shape. No one wanted to lease it, uh, but it was in prime location. And it was a very exposed building to sunlight. It, it really had a lot of uh, solar radiation. And uh, we developed uh, a system uh, software that analyzed the building in its four orientations and came up with a design solution through external louvers that gave the building identity whilst at the same time impeding the solar radiation hit the facade 100% of the time, which suddenly was a super plus for the building because you are uh, keeping the heat away and therefore needing to use less air conditioning. So the solution to a much bigger database with a lot of artificial intelligence and the way you can start interacting those building schemes with the building user and having areas of the building react differently to the user. For example, I'm sure you know lots of people that you may be comfortable in a certain um, temperature, temperature zone and the person sitting next to you in the office may feel comfortable a little bit cooler or a little bit uh, you know, warmer. So why not have uh, building schemes 
that can actually respond to you if you're sitting by the window. Why doesn't the window next to you react to the to the needs of that user? You know, why do we have to do building elevations, building facades that behave the same all the way across? So there's the beginning of a lot of different iterations between the building user and the technology and the availability of data. As you move through the building, the building will also react and address proactively to what you're going to need. So they may know, you, you know your, your pattern through the building as you come in to the way you use the building until you go out. And there's so many more things that are, are going to be influencing and informing our buildings, but not only our buildings, but our neighborhoods and our cities. A building is a chain of a much, a much larger necklace that uh, forms a, a unity. That's the important thing to understand. The interesting thing that I've been thinking about uh, with COVID is that uh, we have all these people uh, realizing that they're able to be as effective and efficient, potentially or actually, uh, working remotely. So the need for large buildings, skyscrapers that house just endless floors of workers coming together at the beginning of the day and then leaving at the end of the day. Uh, it's It starts to look like a, uh, a computer server that all this data comes in and it interacts and it, and it goes out. But now with Zoom and working remotely and being forced to recognize that we can actually do this fairly effectively, as technology advances, the need for these buildings, the need to actually go get in a plane and go meet someone face to face as technology becomes that much closer to reality, the ability to communicate, um, it's going to drastically change, reduce the need for, I'm not sure, uh, our, our building designs uh, and scale of our buildings, I would think. Uh, what are your thoughts on that? Well, I, I think it may happen for a little, but I think in the long run, um, even if technology really takes a huge leap ahead and uh, changes, uh, transforms this 2D communication into 3D, if we can bring, as we can bring now, audio and video signal, but imagine we can also bring a smell and scent and taste and, and feeling to touch, you know, we were seeing this, these new holograms, which will also uh, bring us here. We'll have, we'll, I think we'll get much closer to telepathy. Um, we will be able to communicate in a much more closer um, and proximity situation than we do today. I still believe people will need and want to get together. I believe that, you know, humans belong to tribes. I believe that we are we are folks in a way. Um, I believe cities uh, were invented uh, thousands of years ago as a place to gather, a place to come together, to exchange goods, to exchange ideas, to you know exchange culture, to generate society. And therefore, I, I don't believe all this technology is going to make us all isolated parasites uh, scattered around the, the you know the, the green fields. So I believe there may there, you know there may be some changes. You will find some sectors, you will find certain businesses where remote uh, may work for some time. But at the end of the day, uh, I believe the human being will want to uh, return to come together. Yeah, there, there's, there's something about actually being physically present that uh, is undeniable in, in, a, um, in an emotional, artistic uh, relationship, interaction. 
I uh, each one of those things you described can currently be done not in person but through technology, but it's a it's a reduced uh, manifestation or an attempt at that manifestation. It's reduced and it's not fully complete uh, because it's mimicking the in-person reality. But as that changes, I would imagine work would would drastically change with that, but we'd still maintain this, you know, 125 people, you know, circle interactions. There'd be, I wonder if there'll be a return to more uh, rural, smaller town living where the bigger cities will remain the people that truly actually uh, desire to be in that more densely populated, culturally interactive environment. It will start to see a little bit more of a separation of uh, further separation and really of personality types that want to live like that and personality types that want to live like that. And the buildings that accommodate that in a city, they're ha- they have to change in some way. But I, I just I wonder what that, you know, genuinely looks like in the future. Well, I, I think that the continuous growth of cities is unstoppable. And it's the only way to make them economically viable. So cities will continue to grow and cities will continue to attract population. Uh, The idea of having people living in small villages and, you know, living more close to nature um, may happen in a very, very, very small proportion. Uh, You also have to think that the rise of a future population is immense. So today we have 7.8 billion people, 50% live in cities, so that's 3.6 billion. In 2050, we'll be over 10 billion people and uh, 75% will live in cities. That's uh, 7.5 billion. So that's, that's the entire world population. Imagine in 30 years, everyone living in the planet will be living in cities. So therefore, the real challenge is how are those cities going to grow, how they're going to be economically viable, how they're going to respond to society's needs, how they're going to be structured and organized in, in terms of mobility, in terms of uh, green spaces, in, st- in terms of accessibility to different infrastructure and healthcare and education and culture and leisure and living. That's the real challenge. To me, um, of course, entertaining people that want to live in, in, in the outskirts and live in, in green fields, it's uh, perfectly viable. But in terms of vast numbers, in terms of what is going to happen, I have no doubt people will continue to move towards cities. Hmm. Um, so you have, uh, you've been at the center of uh, the design implementation of uh, structures, buildings uh, that influence and affect a a lot of people's lives. Heathrow, Terminal 2, Zaragoza, and Logan. Those three, um, what were the most difficult challenges of those projects and how did you solve them? Because when I look at a project like that, I know there had to be some things that were so incredibly difficult, and there had to be a creative solution to solve it. Well, they, they all have different different challenges. Let's start from, let's, let's go chronologically, if you want. Uh, Zaragoza uh, had, was, was really an aspiration and a design for a new airport for the World Expo of 2008, 2008 in Zaragoza. And we basically had 12 months to design, build, and open to the public. Wow, that's, uh, that's, you need more than that for a house. Yeah, and it couldn't just be a shed. You know, it had to be an icon. Uh, Zaragoza was housing the world uh, water and environmentally uh, sustainable uh, world expo. Uh, that challenge, you know, when we were approached to design that, well, we actually won that on a competition. But basically our first reply to the client was, Give me a contractor on day one and let me work out this design with a contractor and we will work day and night. We will do three shifts and we'll get it done. And that's what we did. 
We had wow. three shifts around the clock for 12 months and we opened on time. In fact, I think we believe, I think we opened a week in advance, so we one week early. So you, you did design and construction of an airport in one year, start to finish. Wow. Okay. That's incredible. Heathrow was a, a much bigger challenge. Uh, we have to remember that I was actually a relatively small airport designed for three, three, four, four million passengers. Heathrow's challenge was different. It was about designing a new terminal in the middle of uh, an operating airport with existing terminals. So it was not refurbishing the former Terminal 1, it was demolishing the former Terminal 2 and part of Terminal 1 and the European and the control tower and replacing in the middle of that space a new terminal for 20 million passengers whilst at the same time keeping the busiest airport in the world in operation and bringing wow. everything through that little tunnel. Anyone that has driven through Heathrow by car, to Heathrow by car will get there through a really tiny, narrow tunnel. That was the only way to get every single material in. And by the way, uh, this building sits on top of the London Underground, um, which is, I think it's about five feet on, on top of the London Underground. So. Uh, you know, it was, it was really compact. Mm. The other challenges we had for this building were also we had to open, be opened in a specific time frame. And we had, a, we had a reasonable budget, but there was no way we could go over budget. It also had another aspiration, which was to become the first building which emitted 40% less CO2 emissions than a contemporary building. So we, we had lots of challenges. This one was resolved, as I was saying at the beginning, by really not letting the hurry uh, trip us over and understanding the basics of what was really needed. We had to understand the facing. We, we needed to understand how we could put this building here whilst keeping the building in operation, all the airport in operation and demolishing the other buildings. We had to think about all the systems. Uh, both um, both uh, active and passive systems to make the building really energy efficient. We also had to re re reply to the aspiration that this building really wanted to be London's new icon, uh, and, and so on, so on, so on. So what we really did, I think, is we built the best team. I think... The best team or I've, I've had ever, or one of the best teams I've, I've had ever, was about really being able to distribute all those different tasks to very experienced and skilled people, and then being able to coordinate and bring all that into a harmonious re reply and solution. In, obviously, continuous conversation with the contractor, with the client, and with the airlines, otherwise it would have failed. And there you see the result. It's the first um, Briam excellent airport building in the world. It's been awarded the best public building in the world, the best terminal building in the world. Uh, you know, we have 27 international awards. And at the end of the day, you know, it's a building that gives London pride. The Queen herself accepted the building being named after her. It's, it's known as the Queen's Terminal, which, you know, means a lot to everybody. And everyone that I speak to that worked in this project is so proud of it. And everyone thinks and tells their children, I did that. And I think that's the real success. And finally, Logan. Lo Boston Logan is also a very interesting um, proposition because Boston acknowledges that the new terminal is the front door, is the first image to Boston. And, and Boston is taking a huge step forward in becoming more international. 
they receive all those um, international students and they have all this uh, new technology, all the uh, healthcare uh, industry around, and they really want to make it a big statement. And, and Boston had an, and has a number of challenges, like all these big projects do, they all have big challenges. One, of course, like all of them, is, is the cost, uh, the facing, the timing, uh, getting everyone on board. But what I would like to uh, perhaps highlight of, of the solution of Boston is that making a building an icon that really relates to the place, that is really something local, something that is not transplanted from somewhere else, that can only be there. In the terms of Boston, what we did was we, we really reflected on, on, the, on the history and on the roots of Boston and, you know, being one of the oldest uh, cities in, in the country and also identities of Boston, you know, their legacy, their universities, their um, open spaces, their, uh, their buildings, uh, their, their, um, all their technological and looking at you know, those brick buildings and looking at those beautiful sunsets. So when you're at the airport and you look downtown, you get some of the most beautiful sunsets I've, I've ever seen. So we wanted to bring that brick, that open space, all those um, foliage in, in autumn when leaves come down with all those beautiful reds and yellows and, and that sunset. So we wanted to bring all those things into the building. And what we did was we specifically designed, so we spent three days in a, labor in a paint laboratory in Switzerland, designing a prismatic paint, a, a red prismatic paint that changes, varies from dark yellows through oranges, reds and dark reds. So the actual building roof is bringing in all those light qualities and values from downtown Boston onto the terminal, making it, you know, the door into the into Boston. Well, that Boston's very interesting to me. I live just about an hour north of Logan and use that airport uh, anytime we're traveling internationally for work or for pleasure or anything else, and. Uh, That'll that'll be really cool to see implemented. When when do you think this will be complete? Well, I know they're on track, and uh, I prefer to leave that statement there. No, nah. <laughs> okay. Well, I'm I'm excited to see that. I know uh, tra We sh we actually photographed the United Arab Emirates lounge uh, in Logan, uh, but the the approach to Logan, where Logan is located, it all leaves a little bit to be desired. You go down a really, a really uh, utilitarian road. The approach that we take from the north, Route 1, is just, it's endless uh, fast food signs and large billboards. And, and then you get to the airport and it's really, it feels like just a road and then you're at the airport. And there is no there's no iconic like moment of, oh, wow, here's the airport. And it, it, it didn't, it doesn't leave any visual effect on you. It doesn't leave much, you know, I can't, I can't actually visualize what Logan looks like right now, other than, you know, the experience of going into the terminal and everything else. There's no iconic exterior to me. Uh, from my experience with it. And so that'll, I saw renderings or, or uh, what you have on your website and, or what I looked up and, and I'm, I'm very excited about it and to hear about the paint, that'll be really cool to see how that works. Um, when you, uh, when you design something like a international airport like this, what is step one what is the first step well sometimes we are given uh, an airport brief where we're basically given you know dimensions number of check-in desks number of back claims number of uh, gates 
So we do a we do a check. We make sure that uh, there's enough. There's there's never too little. Sometimes you know you need more. So that's one thing we do in parallel to again starting the process of understanding, talking to the client, talking to the stakeholders, talking to the airlines, and understanding what is it that they really looking for and achieving. Then the other thing we do, and I personally do, I, I move to the, to the city. I move to the city for some time. And I leave the city, I walk the city, I cycle the city, I drive the city, I eat, dine, get in, I talk to the people. Uh, you know, I'll, I'll check into a, a hotel for two weeks and I'll, then I'll return uh, two weeks later. So I try and get the flavor from the place. So I, I try and become local. Uh, the other thing we, we've normally done that before we start is we've identified and teamed up with the best um, local teams. So, you know, everywhere we go, we try and be local. And that's also meaning that we need to team up with, with the best local uh, teams and consultants. Uh, we put together the best team, uh, both in our office and in terms of engineering. And uh, we, we start the process. But again, we put the passenger first. So as soon as we start the, the process with that philosophy I was describing before, with those three pillars of, of that philosophy, uh, we put passengers first and, and then we get the ball rolling. So from your, from your time you spent in Boston working on Logan, what's your, what's your impression of Bostonians and Boston in general? You know, in, in the research, they tend, Bostonians tend to be uh, less friendlier than they really are. <laughs> yes. Uh, I don't know why people tend to yeah, think they, yeah. they are far away. And maybe because obviously you go through all those months with such a severe weather that people tend to, you know, be more recluded. But I found Bostonians to be really close, really friendly, really open. Um, they share with you. Um, I, la I like the city very much because you can walk to most places. So you can get by without using a car. And um, I love the, the way the city is structured with its green um, parts in, you know, in a larger uh, and then in a smaller scale. Yeah, Boston's an interesting city in that it's a it's a very well known city in the U.S., uh, but it's also one of the smaller cities. It's it's not that big. I I might be getting this wrong, but I think it's around the twentieth. It's somewhere past the twentieth largest city in the U.S. It's just not that big, but it it holds such a cultural uh, significance to the country. So it's it's pretty interesting. And I I love your description. I don't know that I can exactly repeat it, but like I, Bostonians are far more friendly than they come across. It's it's an interesting city for that and just the northeast in general. People have a a hard candy shell with a soft chocolate filling, I guess, or you know. Um you favor designing structures to include a taste of the outdoors by increasing the exposure to sunlight. This is something we can all emotionally understand but cannot necessarily articulate. Could you explain why you favor this in design and how you implement it? Well, I think as human beings, we were designed to interact with our environment and with nature. And therefore, uh, natural light is an essential part of our well-being and our day-to-day. -day. The human mind is connected to the exterior light and obviously conditions like temperature and, and other climatic um, conditions. But natural light is probably the most important in terms of connecting with your uh, state of mind, with your mood, with uh, your anxiety. So therefore, my favorite building material, I always say, is natural light. It's the cheapest, but it's also probably the most difficult to use. Because natural light uh, carries a lot of different uh, conditions with it. 
which also vary depending on location. So in some places you want natural light to bring in the sun into the building because you want the, the, the solar radiation, you want to bring in the heat from the sun into the building because you want to use that heat in an effective way. On other locations, you want it to keep it out. But it may vary through seasons. So you may want the heat in winter, but not the heat in summer. Um, at the same time, uh, natural light and the sun vary depending on the orientation. You know, sun rises east, sunset is west, and, you know, it changes it is vertical throughout the day, so it rises very low and then it comes higher and then it comes low again. So understanding all the different conditions of that light, and then I take it a step, a step further, which is how do we use that sunlight within different building types? It's not the same sunlight that you want to use in an airport as you may want to use in a hospital or you may want to use in a museum. Can you describe the airport and museum difference for me with light? Of course. Um, let's take a museum. Well, most museums tend to enclose themselves from the exterior light because natural light carries ultraviolet, not only solar radiation, but also ultraviolet. And these two uh, radiations damage paintings. Whilst current museum designers fail to acknowledge that all those paintings, or most paintings, were designed when there was no artificial light. So it's a complete contradiction. You have paintings from the 15th, 16th, 17th, 18th, 19th century painted only to be seen with natural light, which are now being displayed in areas with artificial light. And you, and you have to remember, artificial light can only, in the best condition, replicate 70% of a light spectrum of natural light. So it's a 30% of a natural light spectrum that you cannot replicate, replicate artificially. So the success is to lit museums with natural light without damaging the paintings. And there's only very few in the world that dare do that. And we know we've done that with Renzo Piano in Santander, on the Botin ah. Center. And it's all about bringing in the natural light from the north, because the natural light from north has no radiation, and then protecting from, from ultraviolet as well. And, and if using different means to protect with uh, with uh, external louvers or cantilevers or whatever means you're using for the light not to hit the windows. Whilst uh, an airport is a, a completely different beast. I'll, I'll take you through London Heathrow Terminal 2 or, or Pittsburgh. It's all about giving enough light for the passenger to move intuitively through the building. So the light is helping them go intuitively to the plane or get out of, 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 of the building, whilst at the same time providing enough light so that they can read their boarding card or they can you know, naturally read something, but avoiding glare so you don't want too much light. Uh, at the same time being energy conscious. So in some airports, you may want some heat in the winter. On some airports, you don't want the heat ever. And in the case of Heathrow, for example, all the roof lights are facing north. But we also wanted to make that building look like it was undercrofted, like it, you know, like it had no roof, because we wanted to give back to London or to tell Londoners that London is not grey all the time anymore. When I lived in London as a student, London was always grey. With climate change, London is sunny many, many days. So 
by opening the building to the natural light and the natural sky, we have actually given Londoners back or informed Londoners that, you know, they have beautiful blue skies. Yeah, my, uh, my wife and I spent uh, two years ago our anniversary in London, and uh, I think we had five days of pretty much upper 60s, lower 70s weather, which I'm not sure what that is in Celsius, but uh, really, really beautiful weather for like five days while we were there. Walked all over the city. It was just absolutely amazing. So uh, silver lining to climate changing, but not probably worth it in the long run, but very nice. <laughs> um, so in uh, what about in hospitals? Is there a... Uh, is there a sanitation, uh, concer not concern, but a desire to get natural light in for sanitation reasons with hospitals? Of course, of course. I mean, we very, very rarely in Spain, you would have operating theaters uh, with natural light. And uh, we actually managed to change legislation, state legislation and national legislation to bring operating theaters out to the facades and bring in natural light. Because as I was saying before, the, the spectrum of the light is so much better, and therefore physicians and, uh, and doctors can operate in much better light conditions. Also, we design hospitals avoiding the typical dual sterile corridor, which means that most of our uh, consulting rooms and labs can actually also benefit from natural light. And uh, it's, it's fantastic for the workers, especially. I mean, I, I love listening also to people that use the building once it's been in, operate, in operation for a while. And uh, when I visit some of our hospitals, you know, staff, members of staff say, you know, I've never worked in such a wonderful place like this one. And that is very important to us as well. How often do you go to the buildings you've completed specifically to observe how they're being used and how the individuals are actually using them, enjoying them? Are they using them in the way that you attended? Do you ever do that? Yes, I, as frequently as I can. Yeah. Uh, I'm also user of some of my buildings. So one thing is seeing them as a user. Another thing is seeing them as an observer. But I, I always uh, want to go back. I always go back. Uh, what are some of your current initiatives and projects that you're working on now that you're excited about? Well, we have uh, very interesting work in uh, South America, in, in Chile. We're working on a museum and we're working on uh, two hospitals. We are uh, on the Dominican Republic. We are starting... Uh, the first oncologist uh, children's hospital of the region in connection with uh, St. Jude from the United States. We are also designing uh, different um, um, buildings in the Dominican Republic. So we are involved with uh, uh, master planning. We, we do a lot of master planning and a new, we're doing a, a new airport in the Dominican Republic. Oh, wow. we, we're also moving on to, we've done a few hotels. We're getting also more involved with hotels and uh, designing two mixed use office towers. So there you go, you have clients which post COVID still, you know, uh, go strong on, and haven't canceled and go strong on, on towers. So, and then, you know, back in Spain, as I was saying before, we completed a university campus. We've just started a new university campus on a different city, uh, this time for a, a private university. Uh, we are doing the renovation of the two most important towers in Madrid. Imagine we were renovating the, uh, the Twin Towers of New York. So that's what we're doing. We are completely transforming and changing the Twin Towers of Madrid. So we are involved in a lot of different building types, all very, very interesting. Well, I 
really appreciate uh, the time to be able to uh, pick your brain uh, because you've you've been involved on things that have effect on on the world, which are, is just really interesting to be able to get some of your time. I really appreciate it. I really appreciate your philosophy and how personally you're interacting and and planning your own family even. Um, I'm going to take a lot away from that. I really appreciate your time today and your thoughts on these things. And thank you so much for taking the time and coming and talking with us. Thank you, Trent. And thank you for the dialogue. It was a very interesting dialogue, conversation. Thank you. All right. Thank you, Luis.